Hey there, everyone, and welcome to episode 8 of the Dark Parade. We are very rapidly closing in on double digits, and uh, folks, let me say, I'm excited. Um, this is the final episode in our series about Night of the Demons. We have done the, uh, the first three uh, films in the franchise, and of course there was a remake. And this, I'm, I'm really excited to welcome Don and Ellie uh, to the show, and you'll hear me talk about this with Don, but he is truly one of the great supporters of horror podcasts out there, and we never really had much opportunity to work together, and certainly not one-on-one -on -one like that. It was a, a great time. I was really, really pleased uh, to get him on the show. He, he's seen every horror movie in the world, and it's great to hear him talk about uh, a movie like this that is sort of... Uh, much maligned in a lot of ways and, and largely forgotten, I think. And uh, when we were posing the, uh, the the series, when I was reaching out to, to hosts to see who wanted to uh, participate, Don very quickly was like, I'm on the remake. Let me do the remake. Um, and I not only appreciated him uh, falling on that grenade, but also the expertise that he brings to things and just the boundless enthusiasm that he continues to bring to horror podcasting and uh he's just a great guy and i was so pleased that we could work together on this and uh i i look forward to doing a lot more with him in the future so um in addition to that let me just say uh thanks for coming along on the ride for this season uh or the series of episodes and once more we continue to make strides on uh, the Dark Parade and growing our listenership and all that. And that's largely thanks to you listening. Uh, I really appreciate it. You guys are the absolute best. Um, thanks for dropping by the Facebook group. Thanks for hitting, hitting me up on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, you know, just being part of the community. And, and as I've said a number of times, one of the things that I wanted to do with this show was to really foster that sense of you know, we're all in this together in a way. Uh, so if there are series that you want to hear me and my guests cover, uh, if there are movies that you want us to do, I'll do some one-off movies here and there, uh, just not this time. You know, please hit me up. I'm I'm more than interested to hear your thoughts, uh, as well as on the bonus stuff we do, the found footage fool stuff. Uh, Heart of Horror, turns out everyone loves to hear Kate talk about her past relationships. I am one of those people that enjoys those stories, so I, I'm very glad that we get to enjoy that stuff together. Um, and there's going to be more coming soon. Like, truly, we're going to continue to expand uh, the the realm of the Dark Parade. I want to push a little bit into comics and a little bit into books as well. Um, and I'm trying to figure out exactly how I want to do uh, new movies and new features and that kind of thing. But uh, that stuff is all going to be part and parcel of uh, this little project so um thank you again for listening and uh buckle up it is going to be a wild ride as we talk about eddie furlong in the night of the demons remake and once more welcome to the dark parade uh, as promised with me is the uh the man who launched a thousand podcasts uh, the eponymous Don and Ellie, um, which it makes it sound like you are the head of a mafia, which <laughs> it, I kind of think you might be because you're, um. you're constantly in like, you're, you know, for what it's worth, if listeners don't know this, you are constantly promoting other people. So yeah. s for the moment, screw those guys. <laughs> promote yourself sir uh well uh yeah thank you for uh, having me on um funny you say that um i actually started on podcasting on a show called the horror mafia <laughs> so um yeah that was uh kind of fortuitous you said that but um yeah, yeah uh it's one of my passions uh i love getting the word out uh you know doing this is uh I wouldn't necessarily say a hobby, but uh, it, it, it just feels really good to just give back to the community, sh you know, share the wealth. We're all one family and, you know, we're all here do talking the same thing, you know, just because, you know, you're into one th thing doesn't mean you can't like this other group that's doing the same thing, you know, just a little differently. So 
and I, I have absolutely no qualms just sharing the wealth, putting everybody out there on the same platform and saying, hey, guess what? You know, these guys release their shows. If you like them, you like what they're about, give them a listen, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, with you guys, I mean, you know, Legion, Dark Discussions, you know, whatever platform, you know, Dreadnet Central, whatever network. Yeah, it, it means nothing to me. I'm just happy to share the wealth. Yeah, I, I right. And I, I get really taken aback at times when somebody gets real possessive about that kind of thing. You know, where, uh, you know, because we have our Facebook pages and so forth on Legion. And I'm like, yeah, go ahead, post whatever you want, man. I mean, we're not, uh, obviously that we're, we focus on the Legion shows, but, you know, there's so much cross-pollination between, like, us and, and some of the Dark Discussion shows. And, right, like, yeah. well, like, I'm very at much... The time, at the time, Horophilia, when that was around. Yeah, Horophilia, and, like... I'm, before too long i'm gonna be on creature comforts with you guys and i'm super excited (laughs) about that and so it's like yeah we're all like you said we're all in the same family and and uh you're just one of those people that's constantly really positive and really focused on just sort of letting everyone know like hey there's other stuff going on in the community not just my stuff and it's something that i certainly try to take a page out of your book because you do it the right way um (laughs) But again, screw all them. I'm here to yeah. talk to you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, I mean, I think this is uh, maybe the second time we've ever podcasted together because I know we we were talking. We did one show together two or three years ago on uh, Cinema Beef where we did uh, an episode together. But yeah, um, uh, since this is the case, you know, first time together, uh, I'm an open book. What do you want to know? All right. Well, here's what I really want to get into is this business with Night of the Demons cuz you you are essentially the anchor of this series because you're bringing it all home. And you know, we did Night of the Demons 1 2 3. Uh I am a self-professed if people have listened to the previous episodes. I love uh most of these movies to one degree or another and I'm kind of a weird fan of Night of the Demons 2. That's really kind of my favorite of this series uh just because it's so weird and goofy and and goes all over the place um and night the the remake this 2009 remake is what we're talking about here and you were when i kind of pitched this out to some hosts you were like the remake let me do the remake yeah um so the reason why i pitched for the remake is um one of the weirdest reasons that um, I, I think you'll ever find on one of these shows, that was actually the first one I saw. Um, really? Yeah, that was actually the first one in the franchise I saw. Um, so it's not that I don't have any kind of like a love or attachment to the original, which I, I really do. It's a, it's a fun film and I really like it, but I, I don't have any kind of like nostalgia for it. I had actually never even seen it until the remake came out. And when the remake came out, that was the first I'd ever heard of the the title to begin with. I didn't even know it was a remake until I saw it on the credits, you know, adapted from the story. And I looked it up and I was like, oh, crap. Wow, this is a remake. So, yeah, um, this was actually the first one I saw in the franchise. That's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Well, that's what I just said. You know, this is like the weirdest um, explanation for it is that, yeah, I saw the remake first and I I always felt it was kind of short shafted when it came out because it was sort of like at the tail end of that weird scene in, in the early 2000s where it was just remake crazy and everybody was pumping stuff out, you know. You had the Jay Horror scene where everybody was remaking, you know, Grudge and The Ring and One Missed Call and Shudder and dozens of other crappy films that's not worth mentioning. You know, you had The Fog, you had um, Halloween, you had, um, you know, Hills Have Eyes, and you had, uh, you know, the rumors that Nightmare on Elm Street was getting remade. And so, yeah, um, like, you know, the early 2000s, there was this weird remake trend and you know you have the you know it started with the j horror stuff and you know you had you know the ring and the grudge and dark water and one missed call and shutter and 
dozens of other films too crappy to mention. Uh, you had, um, you know, The Fog and The Hills Have Eyes and Halloween. Rumors that Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th were going to get re rebooted. You know, Texas Chainsaw had come out. You had, you know, stuff like Hills Have Eyes and you know, all these other, you know, franchises and films that were being rebooted and remade. And it just sort of carried over into like the 2010s with Fright Night and Carrie and, you know, a couple of other, you know, the thing, you know, Oh, John Carpenter stuff. But I always felt this one was kind of like overlooked and kind of like short shafted just because it kind of got lost in the shuffle. And to me, I always put this as kind of like one of those like top 10 underseen or undervalued or underrated, whatever, you know, invoke term you want to use. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not, you know, the thing or the fog or night invasion of the body snatchers and like, you know, the top tier kind of stuff but like if you want to like dig deep into like the underrated you know under whatever like I said whatever term you want to use this was always one that I always would say is you know one that you should revisit because there's a lot more going on than you realize all right well uh with that defense uh in front of us let's uh let's kind of jump into the story and um so it it's a loose remake and there one of the things I do like about it is it, it kind of starts with a prologue that gives you the setup for what's about to happen with the rest of the film, where you have uh, this character of Evangeline Broussard uh, is the name of the lady. But it's basically her being chased on, onto a balcony where there's a guy who looks strangely like Jeffrey Jones. Uh, yeah, I thought that too. <laughs> <laughs> chasing her uh, as as if he is a truant officer gone bad and uh, yeah it is like you know come back here and she's like you're not human and then tosses a noose around her neck and jumps off and uh, what again I like the viciousness of this where it's not her just snapping her neck and dying the head just totally comes off <laughs> and <laughs> And lets you know what kind of what you're in for with this movie, um, as far as it just going sort of gleefully over the top at times, and yeah, and I, I dig this open. I think that uh, it, in terms of establishing setting and kind of giving you the vibe of what the movie is, uh, I, I I prefer it to the opening of the original, quite frankly. Yeah, it's a lot more hard hitting. It definitely is a much more visceral thing. It, you know, like you said, you know, it's not just the noose hanging; it's the actual decapitation that occurs as a result. And then you get that little flash at the end where you see the fact that he actually wasn't human. You get that little eye glare thing that comes into play later on when the, the rest of the possession takes place. It kind of like gives you like that little hint of like, okay, the, like there's that thing with the eyes that they do. And it gives you a little hint of for later on, and that's, it, it, yeah, it's a it's a fun little open. It's a nice little like you know traditional shock horror kind of cold opening that gets you involved in this. And yeah, it's a it's a fun ride. All right, so let's uh, after our, our credits, we we meet our main group of characters. So we'll kind of take these mostly one by one. There's Angela, as played by Shannon Elizabeth of American Pie fame. And she is a party promoter, I guess. Yeah, that was always my main thing, because it's certainly what it looks like she's doing, especially with the way that she interacts with the police later on. I know that's kind of jumping the gun a little. But yeah, um, I, I never knew what she was. It, I always just assumed that she was kind of like a local fly, you know, word of mouth celebrity in the city that just, you know, hosted events for people to just, you know, get fucked up and drunk and buy their drugs and you know screw each other and stuff like that you know like you know but in the days before like this sort of thing was like really all over the internet like just like a word of mouth kind of like party promoter kind of a person yeah yeah and because she sort of complains aloud that she needs a party that's going to be a big hit and because she's low on money and i guess you know the the money being taken at the door uh, by as it happens, Tiffany Shepis for you know who's in this movie for about 
38 seconds more than me. But uh, I always appreciate it when she shows up. Um, but yeah, so there's her. She's the one setting this party up. And then there are sort of the three main female leads who are Maddie, uh, as played by Monica Kina. Then there's Suzanne, who is Bobby Sue Luther, I think is her right. name. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Lily, who is uh, Dara Baird, I think is how you Diora, pronounce it. Diora Baird. Diora Baird. Diora Baird. And uh, Maddie is dressed up as a zombie. Uh, Lily and Suzanne both dress as uh, uh, cats. Um, which uh, should be pointed out, um, it was an inadvertent thing. Um, they both saw cat ears and wanted the costume to go with it. Yeah. And that's kind of like a little... It's like a little rivalry thing between the two of them. Right. And there, uh, Maddie is definitely the good girl. She's our final girl. We know that right away because she's not talking about sex immediately. Uh, Mm, (laughs) Unlike Maddie, or not Maddie, uh, unlike Lily and Suzanne, who are, like, this is a horny movie in general. But from jump, they are like, we are going to this party, and we are going to get fucked up, and we are going to screw. And right, that, yeah, that's sort of happening. sort of like playing off of what we said earlier about Angela being the party promoter for those kinds of situations. Right. And they also say, hey, by the way, if Angela is 100% going to try to make out with whatever guy you're interested with. So don't don't hold it against her. It's who she is. It's going to happen. Ju- if you want to hang on to your guy, just be on top of him before she does. Mm-hmm. And so they're headed to the party. Along with them is Colin, as played by Edward Furlong or Eddie Furlong, depending on you know what movie he's in. And he plays a guy named Colin, who is kind of a lowball drug dealer. Yeah, something like that. Like a. Uh... You know, that sketchy guy that hangs out at the park after dark trying to sell you something? You mm-hmm. know, the guy that will, the guy that'll follow you into the gas station bathroom and try to, like, sell you some pot or some ecstasy or something, or what he'll claim is ecstasy, but you never really can trust that that's what he's giving you? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, well, look, we've all got to get through college, Don. Um, I'm not blaming you. I've never said that was uh, something to blame. I just said that was the kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. I've, you know... Sometimes when when you're trying to make ends meet, uh, I'll I'll follow someone into a bathroom. Well, when I was allowed. Hey, any kind of entrepreneurial work is fine by me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's the you know spirit of America, and exactly. <laughs> so, so Colin is given this ultimatum by his supplier because he, I don't know I, I something happened with the last deal or he just didn't get get enough money for the product he had or whatever. And he's like, hey, I just let me go to this party that Angela's throwing, and I can make up all the money there. And the, the supplier is like, well, if you don't, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. So, you know, we've got our ticking bomb of the movie, I guess, is he's going to get murdered if he doesn't sell enough drugs, which feels like uh, the plot of a Saints Row game. Uh, you'd know more than me. I'm not a huge gamer, so. All right. Well, listen. If you ever want to do a simulator where you're selling drugs, uh, <laughs> I've got the game for you. But um, yeah, so all of these individuals are headed for the party. Um, Colin, to get in, has to bribe Tiffany Shepas. Uh, and, and actually, one of my favorite parts of the movie is him slipping her uh, the twenty. And her saying, well, an Andrew Jackson costume isn't going to get you in, but maybe a Ben Franklin costume will. Uh, I think that's a good way to put it. Like, don't be cheap. Yeah. <laughs> You're trying to sell drugs at this big party. Let's not start with a 20. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, of course, it's Tiffany Shepard, so you know it's going to be a fun scene regardless. So Yeah, yeah. She is truly one of those sort of B grade. Not she is not a B grade actress, but she is an actress that shows up in a number of B grade movies, and she's always a little bit better than the movie she's in, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, but I also have had a long standing crush on Tiffany Shepas. 
Um, yeah, same here. <laughs> uh, yeah. What, what, what's her husband's name? Trent Retta? Is that her husband? Uh, Trent's the last name. I don't remember his first name. Yeah. Because I know she he goes by Tiffany Shepis Tretta now. Yeah. Sean Tretta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because they met on the set of that one movie she made. That's right. Yep. So, um, anyway, son of a bitch. So, uh, yeah. So, the the party kicks off. And it's, you know, a lot of early 2000s, or not early 2000s, I guess late 2000s is when the movie was uh, shot. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's that kind of music. It's a lot of guitar and bass. The camera does that MTV style speed up, slow down kind of move where you're whipping through the party and seeing naturally a couple of girls are making out somewhere. There are people dancing uh people drinking everybody's having a good time there's a dude dressed up like uh the puppet from saw running around on a tricycle it's uh it's pandelirium right and <laughs> and so uh, into the party come you know Maddie and Lily and Suzanne and they are also joined by uh a couple of dudes who I find mostly forgettable uh, in this movie, but there's um, Dex and Jason. I think are the two main ones. Yeah, I remember. I, re- I remember Dex for sure because they keep saying that name a lot. I, I, Jason, it could be right. Uh, I th- I, I'd have to. I'd have to pull the IMDb up on the page, and I don't feel like doing that at the moment. Fair enough. I think Jason is the the uh, guy in the scrubs. I think he's the the one who, yeah. the guy who lasts the longest. And then Dex is the the one who. Uh, yeah, Dex. Yeah, because I, I, I'm saying I remember Dex said several times, uh, "Jason, that could be right," but I'm not interested in pulling up the IMDb to confirm. Fair enough. So, um. Angela, of course, uh, addresses the crowd and is like, hey, everybody, get fucked up and have some sex and everything's cool. And while the party is kind of in full swing, Maddie excuses herself to the bathroom, which is probably overstated. It's not like she stands up and is like, pardon me, everyone. Uh, Let me go to the laboratory. Um, She just goes to the bathroom. And while she's in there... She looks in the mirror, and then this monster hand comes out after her. Uh, and then when she runs to get her friends, is like, hey, there's a monster hand in the bathroom. And they show up in the bathroom, and sure enough, no monster hand. Yeah, uh, it, it's a solid scare. It, you know, it's not like the best jump scare in the world. You just play it off as, oh, it's just one of her Halloween pranks. She decked the house out like this Halloween haunted house kind of a thing, and that's just one of the things that she just did. So, you know, it, it, yeah, it's a, you know, lame hand wave kind of a thing to, you know, overlook the fact that, you know, a demon hand just bursts through the mirror to grab someone. It, it, it It's not the best in the world, but it's, yeah, for the purposes of moving the plot along, I'll, I'll buy it. Yeah, and for a movie that is, you know, just slightly north of 90 minutes and and has a pretty good pace to it uh again you got to keep the scares coming every few minutes and and also this is to let you know like oh some demon shit is about to pop off at this party but before uh we can get really demonic the cops show up and everyone kind of scatters and colin ends up dumping his drugs into a grate and he takes off and then uh maddie and lily and uh dex and jason all leave as well and there's a bit with the cops and angela where they're like hey you don't have a permit to be throwing a party here you're you're taking money at the door um and meanwhile, Tiffany Shepes has taken off with all the money from the door, by the way. Yeah, as well as exited the movie. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which is unfortunate, but eh, what do you got to do? And um, so then Colin ends up coming back. Like, the, the place 
basically clears out except for Angela and then Lily, Dex, Jason, and Maddie show back up because they're looking for Suzanne who they can't find and also who was real drunk last time they saw her and Colin comes back to retrieve his drugs that he stashed and so that in that way we have reassembled our you know heroes of the movie yeah it's kind of a weird structure um i'm not necessarily sure that it was needed because it just in it just provides all these weird bodies for no reason and does nothing with them yeah i you know i think that i might prefer this though again to the uh, structurally at least to the original because in the original it's just they show up at this place to have a party and then everything pops off yeah um uh, I'll give the original credit in that it makes the way that the original is structured makes me like them more. Whereas this one here, they're presented more as just canon to be slaughtered, you know, meat to be slaughtered later. Yeah. But I... it, it's, it, it's a weird thing where it's kind of like, it just feels so structurally odd to have the party at full force, clear everybody out when you could have used the bodies. It would have made a lot more fun to have the, to have the demons possess the party goers and then have them chase the main group around because the main there's the, there's something connected to the main group that they need to complete the ceremony whereas where we as we discover later it's this you know strange thing where they need seven bodies to you know unleash the ceremony it just it, this is like the one weird thing that I don't like about this one is it, it introduces the bodies and it gives the potential and teasing to have them be the ones that are chasing the main group but then it just it just dismisses them and brings the main group back together that we've just been introduced to yeah yeah i but also if you have that many people running around and you're going to go with this seven bodies thing you would have those seven bodies in about eh, 12 seconds you know <laughs> where it's yeah, like oh we win that, yeah yeah it's just it's a weird thing i'm i i appreciate where it's going and i like the way i like the way it's set up it's just a weird structure for me yeah yeah it would be better for sure if they would if you just got rid of the whole seven bodies thing and just let them be demons yeah. carving up a bunch of these young yeah, adults like I said, yeah. the, it's the seven bodies thing that kind of just screws this one that's like the weird thing is it never really lets it be what it could have been whereas you know like you said it, even though if it you know it turns into a demon's ripoff in a haunted house. I'm, I would be fine with that, but oh, for sure, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, it's just it's a weird structure the way that they have this set up. That's just the way I'm going about it. Yeah, but yeah, so we, we end up going down into the basement of this joint because Colin is looking for his drugs, which have you know fallen down the grate. He believes, and. As they go into this basement, they he ends up seeing uh, a, a hidden door behind some shelves. And so they bust into this secret room where they find uh, a bunch of... Well, they find a tunnel that leads to the next estate. And then they also find uh, a bunch of skeletons, six skeletons, arranged in kind of this rough circle around a central skeleton and Angela is like hey I know what this is these are those people that disappeared when Angelina or Evangeline Broussard had her party and they did this whole seance thing and they went missing and Evangeline Broussard was found dead and they're like well I guess that's cool and uh, Angela checks out the main skeleton the one kind of in the center of the circle and it bites her hand um which basically gives her the demon uh woozies for a bit so. yeah it's the uh it's the mechanism through which the possession starts right and which isn't ter in the original it's just it, they kind of enter someone's mouth and then that basically it follows sort of evil dead rules where if you get maimed or killed by the demons, then you become one. 
Um, this I actually like a little bit more where they say you have to be bitten or kissed. It has to be mouth stuff. And right, yeah. <laughs> it's a fun little fun little touch that I kind of enjoy. Makes it more so that way they have to actually like get their hands on you or like you said put their mouth on you. Yeah. It, you know, it, it it makes them a little bit more of a uh, you know, physical threat that they actually have to do something physical to you. Right. Instead of just, oh, they slash your throat and the next thing you know you're possessed. It it's got to be a little more direct than that and i do think that gives so when all the demons are attacking it gives our heroes a little bit more of a chance to fight back um right yeah but so after angela starts to get a little uh a little wonky in the head colin is like look i'm out of here and starts to leave but then discovers that the gate leading out of the estate is locked and they can't open it and in fact somebody suggests like hey try to lo- unlock it from the other side he's like it doesn't work like that it's just <laughs> i can't get it open um and so they basically decide well we're just gonna have to sleep here tonight until i guess a caretaker would come and open the the place up in the the following day or when they can call a locksmith or something yeah, because they make a they make a point of mention that there's no cell service, so that gets rid of uh, you know the need for cell phones. But yeah, this is another weird thing that it traps them inside. You know, you see the pad on you see the pad on the outside, but it looks very easily like they could have just hopped the fence and done it themselves. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, the, like the fence is like if like I'm saying the fence is probably at maybe the six foot level, like six feet high. high. So it looks like it's like just barely like level with like just barely over the girls' heads and like the same height as the boys. So it just looks very easily like one of them could have just jumped the fence and gotten over and unhooked it. But yeah, uh, the way that they get trapped inside is really kind of clumsy. Where I, I, I get where they're going that you know the police think that the house has been abandoned, so they seal it off. But it, it just kind of comes off as just a little too clumsy and a little too forced. Yeah, it, it would be nice if it, it weren't quite so easy to get stuck in this place or they, they did something to sort of, yeah, uh, like you said, just make this a little cleaner uh, as opposed to it just feeling a little chintzy. Uh, like, it, it's just, it's a little too convenient. The production design should have built up. <laughs> some some of these uh some of these walls a little bit but at any rate that's what's happening they're they're gonna wait out uh the night in this joint and so angela decides well if we're all gonna be stuck here let's play a little spin the bottle and uh by the way it's suzanne now that i'm looking at my notes here who gives the full story of the house of like, oh, eventually in Broussard, practice black magic. And then she was going to uh, basically, she was doing it to kind of woo a guy. Yeah, the um, from what we're told, um, it's actually the guy that approached her at the very end to sort of be like, hey, it's all over, you know, like, you know, everything's fine. That was supposed to have been her target. Where the entire ceremony, the entire gathering was, it, it says that it was supposed to have been a seance that would have helped her communicate in spirit that would have allowed her to woo this guy that she liked that didn't like her back. Yeah. But yeah, uh, the demons just re- the, the demons tricked her into throwing the party and allowed them to take over and you know give us the 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 events of the cold open. So. Right. And uh, the only person who survived this was a maid who went bananas and just ended up scribbling a bunch of spells on the walls. Um, And so she's the only witness, but she's all crazy in the head. So nobody like nobody gets the full story of what happened until as the events of this evening unfold, we kind of get the full story of what happened that night. Um, Right. But Angela uh, decides she's going to play spin the bottle with everybody as her eyes are starting to demon out a little bit, as we saw at the beginning of the movie. 
And there, the one thing I, I like in this scene is there's the scene of the two girls doing the sexy kissing because of a spin the bottle. But then the same thing happens between two dudes. And I'm like, finally, equal representation. Exactly, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, I've said it on numerous shows, and uh, I think it's worth repeating here in this format. Tits and dicks for everyone. I'm open for everything. Right, just don't... Like, it's fine if the movie is horny, but don't be like the horny teenage boy that just wants to see tits. Like, exactly. If the movie's going to be horny, I want all levels of horniness. I want guys and girls, girls and girls, guys and guys. I want nipples and dicks everywhere. And this movie, exactly. to its credit, sure enough, everybody's horny for everybody, which I at least you're consistent, Night of the Demons. Um, but yeah, so uh, after the game of Spin the Bottle, Angela ends up kissing Dex, and that gives him a little bit of demon action and but it's yeah. the same kind of thing where he's like oh what the hell happened like he got bonked on the head with a coconut yeah. or something yeah it was kind of weird the way that like you said you set it up earlier where they had to have been kissed which sort of plays into re- connecting the dots as to how he got it but yeah it it just feels weird because when she got possessed she didn't react like that it's only him where he seems to have some sort of like, he says he's lightheaded for some reason. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like she gets the idea, well, let's just fuck and I'll make you feel better. Like yeah. draining more blood away from that area is not going to help him. <laughs> right. It's the, the, the aspirin of, uh, copulation. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so Lily is like, and also Lily is a little pissed off at how, Angela was super aggressive with the kiss like she was straddling his lap and that kind of thing and so Lily gives it a real I don't think so not my man and drags him off to a a different room where they start fucking and that's where Dex starts to you know go from I'm not feeling so good to you know, I, my eyes are all demoned out and I'm a monster now. Yeah. Like I said, it, you, the, the behavior seems to just be so, really just coincidental. Whereas she didn't really react the way he did because when she is possessed, it, the difference was that, you know, yeah, it was her finger, but she seemed more genuinely concerned that there was actually something wrong. Whereas with him, it just seems like, oh, I'm lightheaded all of a sudden, and now all of a sudden I'm better. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, right, yeah, she does seem to think that there is something evil afoot uh, inside of her, or something is, is clearly wrong, and he's just, he, yeah, he kind of goes zero to demon pretty fast. Um, but this does have another moment I really like, where as he is demoning out and... Uh, doing a little doggy style action with Lily. He, she says, listen, buddy, if you're going to use that hole, you're going to need to, Oh, and then he just starts, yeah. uh, going yeah. after it. Yeah, he goes in anyway. Yeah. Which, which seems to, <laughs> this is the other thing. Apparently it works. Uh, if you're doing mouth stuff or just, uh, you know, sex seems to be the other yeah. method of, of transmission. And, then, well, there's no reason to believe that he's not going to kiss her before, or kissed her before. I mean, right? Because uh, we do kind of cut back between the two of them because initially, when we when we officially when we leave them the first time, she's sitting on the bed, suggestively saying, "I know what'll make you feel better," and he gives her that slice work, like, "Oh, I'm going to get it tonight." Right. Yeah. And then that cuts, and then it cuts back to the group continuing their game. And then when we cut back to them, like maybe a minute or so later, they're doing a doggy. So there's enough implication and time pass to suggest that maybe they could have done it before, especially because as soon as he leaves, he leans over and he presses her against the bed and kisses her there. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so 
she is now infected because we get a cut back to them at one point where they're both possessed and still going at it because you know these demons have been locked away for a while and it's like getting out of prison you want a little action i guess yeah i don't blame them uh they said what 80 some odd years 80 sure yeah I'm, I'm trying to think back from the original story because they said it was it was at least 80 some odd years earlier so yeah i'm gonna be a little pent up too if i'm waiting that long absolutely and so angela then is starting to mac on suzanne a little bit and maddie's like this is weird like she's behaving strangely i don't know what's going on with you know lily and dex so me and colin and jason are gonna head out and see if we can find another way out of here but meanwhile and this is actually probably the best like transformation scene of the movie is um angela essentially is seducing suzanne by dancing with her and there's a moment where the camera's kind of spinning around and they're looking at each other and Suzanne's like, I don't know if this is such a good idea. And Angel's like, no, this is a great idea. And at one point she looks down and realizes as they're spinning that they've they've lifted off the ground. And yeah. I, it's one of my favorite effects of the movie, uh, mostly because it's not that... Like, I'm going to shake my head real fast kind of effect that you see uh, during a lot of the demon stuff. And it just, like, I, it, it's one of the few times where the movie kind of slows down and lets the demon or the possessed person sort of seduce the other person into being a demon. Yeah, um, like I said, you know, we the, the whole film has just shown that they're the horny as hell. Yeah. So the fact that this one actually doesn't just go straight for the jugular and is like, okay, I'm going to play with you and I'm going to seduce you. It, the change of tone, it, it's, it doesn't stand out as being jarring. It's actually like a fun little get, a fun little trick. So yeah, I'm definitely with you. And, uh, you know, you have the two hottest girls on the film doing it. So I'm totally fine with that on that end as well. <laughs> sure. Sure. I mean, if you're going to be... And- Speaking of this movie being horny, oh my god, the amount of cleavage and boobs almost coming out of tops is crazy. Like yeah. <laughs> every every girl in this movie just has tits on display. And this is another reason that you know, as we were discussing earlier, I feel like somebody uh on the male side should have just had their balls hanging out. Or at least been more of a, you know, ab friendly presentation for their costume yeah I, I feel like the the guy that's with uh lily i feel he could have had a little bit more of like a sexy police officer costume yeah just like showing off in like the trunks with the swat badge or something a little something for the ladies that's all yeah i mean you could have definitely done that and i wouldn't have batted an eye at it yeah but yeah there, there's a boy adam girish the director of this movie loves his tits um, so anyway, while they're dancing, uh, around in midair, once Suzanne realizes what's up, uh, she looks at Angela who turns into a demon face and then gets her, her boobs clawed and then her face pulled off. And, and maybe again, because I think this is my favorite just sequence of the movie because after her face gets uh, slapped off, it lands on the floor mostly intact. And the CGI is not terrible in this case. Or I, I think it's CGI. But maybe there it's just like a practical effect that they sweeten with CGI or something. But it's one of the better effects of the movie, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, I, I'd probably put a couple of the later scenes um, as one of my favorites. Um, there's one in particular that I really kind of enjoy. We'll discuss that later on, but... Uh, yeah, up to this point, there hasn't really been, like, a really big showcase for, like, the demon's power. And I think this is, like, the perfect time to unleash it. Yeah. Um, so, she's now, uh, you know, possessed, but we'll get back to her in a minute. And meanwhile, the rest of our crew is looking for a way out. Jason runs into Lily, who was the 
the lady what was getting it from behind from Dex. And this is where we get a little bit of a uh, tip of the hat to the original movie where she says to Jason, fix my whiskers. And she has a, a tube of lipstick. And he's like, uh, what? And then she pushes the lipstick into her boob. Uh, a la Linnea Quigley, who also has a cameo at the beginning of this movie. You oh, know. that's right. Yeah, we never mentioned that because that's one of the fun little things where we were reintroduced to the guys. They're watching trick or treating over the. I think it's the Mardi Gras strip in New Orleans. Yeah, or it's not like not like the Mardi Gras thing, but it's like where it would be held. They're overlooking like a bunch of trick or treaters, and one of the houses that we see during the montage is Linnea Quigley dressed up as the ballerina or whatever she was from the beginning from the first one she bends over and does the same trick you know grabbing like one last piece of candy for one of the little girls that comes up to the house for trick-or-treating yeah it, yeah i like i said i didn't see the original so i didn't know what that was i was like oh Linnea quickly's in this nice why is she showing off her 50 year old ass well and then yeah. it and then it dawned on me, I was like, oh, oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> so, yeah, that, when I first saw that, that was my initial reaction was, oh, nice, Linnea Quigley. Why is she showing her 50-year-old ass? <laughs> yeah, you know, and, holds up pretty yeah. well as, as far as 50-year-old Definitely, asses go. Yeah. Well, it wasn't the fact that I was complaining. It was just, wait, that, that's what they have her doing? It's just showing off her butt like that? And then I, and then as soon as I rewatched the original, it's like, oh, that makes the scene I complained about in the original, in the in Night of the Demons make a lot more sense. Because I didn't know who it was. I I, I I didn't know what it was when I first saw it. It was just, oh, Linnea Quigley. Her ass? Like, what? The right. hell, that's what they brought her for? But yeah, it makes sense now when we, now that I, I've seen the original, I know what it is. So in addition to mimicking the Linnea Quigley scene with the lipstick from the original, this movie kind of ups the ante a little bit, where not only does... Uh, Diora Baird push the lipstick into her boobie. She then reaches between her legs and pulls out the uh, tube of lipstick from her vagina. And uh, it's all bloody. Well, it starts bleeding profusely and then out comes the lipstick all bloody and goopy. Like there's definitely some yeah. KY going on as well in this mixture. And she kind of offers it to Jason who beats feet pretty quickly and he's like hey guys I don't know if you <laughs> if you were aware of this but Lily is in the other room pushing lipstick into her tit and pulling it out of her puss and that doesn't seem like healthy human behavior yeah uh, it's so weird that they still haven't caught on that anything's happening like this is the one thing that I'll say about the demons in this one is that they even though that they've already worked their way through half the group, the other half of the group is still completely unaware that anything's going on. They're, yeah, they're a little uh, oblivious up until this moment where Suzanne attacks, who is now faceless. And I kind of like the the skull effect that she has. I think that looks pretty good. And so th uh, they get away from Suzanne, and they're like, "Oh yeah, there's the tunnel uh, under the house." we can use that to escape to the next estate and get out of there. And, uh, and they arm up, they get a gun. Uh, there's a big piece of rebar that they grab and, and they head down into the basement to flee. But when they do, they realize that there has been a cave in at some point and that is now blocked off. And they turn around to see, uh, a couple of the demons, Lily and Dex, crawling along the wall toward them, which is, a, a, again, a nice little composite shot that's done here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it sort of turns into like a fun little uh, another little display of their powers where they're able to uh, manipulate these vines out of the walls of the tunnel and grab them to hold them still as they make as the demons make their way down the tunnel and it's like a like a fun little chase scene where they have to break free of their bonds yeah. trying to like break free of the vines before they come at them 
Yeah, it's a you know, it's not the most thrilling scene, but it's a fun little uh, addition to the to the chaos, I would imagine. Yeah, and it's here that Jason kind of gets it in the gut um and is severely injured. So they have to kind of beat off <laughs> the demons. <laughs> Uh, fend off is probably the better way to put it, but I'm sticking with feet off. Not to say that, <laughs> and considering the movie, I wouldn't have been surprised that they actually did beat off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, exactly what I was thinking of. Like, well, it wouldn't have been that crazy if they're like, right. look, we got to jerk off the uh, the Dex demon, and that'll distract him. Uh, but yeah, so they they get past the demons. They're heading back upstairs now that they know. They can't escape through the tunnel, and they end up in what turns out to be the maid's room, um, where uh, Colin, Edward Furlong, notices that there's some writing behind this crumbling plaster, and so they start to kind of peel the plaster off the walls to discover that there are, like, these, you know, pentagrams and spells and stuff written all over the walls. Yeah, it's a real uh, Jack Torrance in the the hall in the hallway from The Shining kind of a thing, where the walls are just littered with um, all kinds of writing. Yeah, it makes you wonder how the hell they actually got it up that high without ladders. Well, I'm sure the maid uh, was very tall. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, this is uh, yeah, it, like I said, it's a straight rip off from The Shining where they have the writing on the wall. But this is where it fills everybody in on the backstory of like what truly happened the night that the demons came forth from the prologue and this is where they give the you know the ammunition necessary to fend off the demons for the rest of the night or what could be the rest of the night yeah and and this is like you said this is the the point where we get hey they're they need seven human hosts and if they kill seven people or possess seven people then hell will be unleashed on earth um, and by the way, these demons were thrown out of hell, by the way, because they were too satanic or something. That was the one thing about that, because initially I always, when I first saw this, I initially had always thought that they were alongside Lucifer in heaven and they joined him when he was cast out. I never remember that they were specifically cast out of hell. Yeah, they said, always, yeah. I know that they say that, but initially they made it sound like they were with Lucifer when he fell. Uh, I'm not versed enough in the Bible to know the specifics, but I remember that when Lucifer fell, th- these demons were cast out along with him because they were alongside of him and trying to aid him and him overthrowing heaven or however that story goes. Like I said, I'm not completely familiar with it. But yeah, it, I initially was confused as to where the demons that originally come from that they were thrown out of hell or they were thrown out of heaven with Lucifer and loosened and were loose upon the earth. That was how I initially took it. Right. And so they, the demons, uh, as we learn kind of (laughs) hornswoggled Evangeline Broussard into hosting the party just so they could take over all of these bodies. And the reason that she killed herself was not just to get away from this guy, but to prevent an apocalypse essentially, because the demons can't take over a dead body. So she murdered herself so that they couldn't possess anyone. And this is also uh, where, as you mentioned, we get the news that, Hey, demons don't like rust. And so they, you can use rusty old iron as a weapon. Right. The line was that the demons were made with ancient material, ancient elements. Iron is an ancient element. Add rust to it. They don't like it. I believe that's almost word for word what they use. Yeah. Yeah. This is a real, like, Jason hates water. Freddy hates fire. How can we use that kind of thing? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so speaking of monica kina um but yeah so everybody decides to take a nap except for maddie and there's a knock at the door and sure enough it's angela uh in non-demon mode 
and Maddie realizes like, oh, you can't get in here because of all the stuff on the walls. And Angela gives her a, oh, there's always a way. There's always a way. And sure enough, uh, the walls start bleeding. <laughs> and Which messes up the spells. And in uh, a, a really funny sequence to be, everybody's trying to write on the walls to replace the stuff that's getting washed away by blood. Right. And then... Yeah, they're they're trying to do that while they're trying to fend off these just random demon hands, sort of like the one from the bathroom that we mentioned at the very beginning. Like just this one random demon hand just poking out of the wall trying to grab at them. Yeah, and they're they're just like frantically trying to like, okay, well we got to replace it, we got to replace it, and nobody's thinking, well why don't we just block the blood from coming? Yeah, it's it's totally um, like that scene from Repulsion. Where the the hands are coming out of the walls in the hallway, but yeah, so eventually the arms just kind of retract, and everybody's like, "Did we? Did we just win? Are they gone now?" And sure enough, like daylight is starting to spill through the windows, and they're like, "You know, I think we did it, guys! Everybody, high five! We won!" Yeah. Um. Well, the reason for that is uh, mentioned. Um, part is part of the uh informa- information dump is that it has to be on halloween night and the idea is that if you survive until sunrise it's over because the demons have to do it all on halloween night yeah. so by thinking it's more by thinking it's morning they figure they're out of they're they're, they're out of the the fire so to speak right so they kind of cautiously open the door and when you know it, no demons. And they're, so they start marching uh, through the house to the entrance. And this is where Colin's like, wait a second. Something doesn't seem right about all this daylight. And so he throws a rock or something through one of the windows. And as it shatters, the daylight vanishes. And all of a sudden, it's night again. And they're like, oh, son of a bitch. We got, we got fooled by these trickster demons. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you figure the you know there's got to be some kind of big confrontation because we haven't had that yet. So it's a yeah. The the running time might give away the fact that it's just a trick, but in the reality, the way that they pull it off is kind of fun, and it it just adds a little bit of like okay, here we go, kind of a feeling to it. Yeah, and so Jason gets got here because Angela just rips out all of his guts. And he turns into a demon. And then Colin and Maddie run back to the maid's room where they're planning to wait until the sun comes up again. But he ends up falling through the floor. (laughs) Probably because he's a little pudgy. Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder how much of that was improvised on set when they saw whatever Furlong's physique was like. Yeah, look, Eddie, can you... How about you lay off the Ding Dogs and the Jack Daniels for the duration? No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. Just have me fall through the floor. Um, But yeah, so he ends up falling through the floors and Maddie goes after him down a rope into the basement. But by the time she gets there, he's all demoned out. And so uh, she gets away from him, gets back to the maid's room where she kind of arms up and it's a real Rambo moment of her like getting the shotgun that they found and putting these old iron spikes in it and wrapping her fist in some rusty iron wire or something and yeah I mean it is a total Rambo moment yeah yeah um, like I said we, you know we still haven't had like the big confrontation yet so so you figure this is like the moment, you know, you know, business is about to pick up, sort of speak. And the way that they do it, like you said, with the spikes and the shotgun shells, and I think she even actually just sticks them down the barrel at one point. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't even remember her actually like stuffing them inside the casing. Because we see that, and then I, she just grabs like a handful of others that she had left behind and just shoves them in her pocket. And then I think at one point in the middle of the fight, she just reaches into her jacket. And just shoves them down the barrel and 
it figures that's what's supposed to kill him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real, like, we're pirates at sea and just using the silverware to, to shoot out of the cannon now. Um, but yeah, so she basically uh, wanders out of the room ready for this final confrontation and starts blasting the demons with her iron-filled shotgun and, uh, like, when... It, we're saying, uh, is it Suzanne that's got the the booby, the booby tentacles? Right, I think that was her because she was the. No wait, Lily was the one. Okay, so Lily has the boobicles. The... Yeah, Lily, Lily, I think that's her. And yeah, so there are these like gross tentacles that come out of her nipples, and one grabs uh, Maddie's arm, and she uses the iron in her fist or the iron wire wrapped around her hand and just presses it to the boobicle and it you know starts to hiss and burn and and retracts um but yeah the boobicles are are out quite a bit in this movie which i i found very funny and uh anyway so uh just like evangeline broussard herself though it looks like maddie is not going to survive and she goes to the balcony throws a rope around her neck and jumps off and unlike Evangeline Broussard her head does not come off uh she just hangs seemingly right seemingly yeah we'll get to that in a second yeah and all the demons are like ah oh, damn it that was our seventh person now we can't possess her because she's all dead and shit back to the basement everybody and and the sun comes out and they all just kind of disappear and turn to ash and that ash then floats back down to the basement to reform those skeletons down there and that's where Maddie kind of like opens one eye and looks around and is like is everything cool coast clear oh yeah these demons are stupid as shit and it turns out that she had actually tied uh, the rope around her waist uh, as well so that she did not actually hang herself and the demons just thought she was dead <laughs> and nobody checked her pulse or nothing but eh, yeah you know. um yeah well to, like i said for uh, the listeners um she actually hangs a safety rope around her waist that's shorter than the rope that she uses around her neck so even though she, she looks like she's physically dropped and hanging from the rope from the noose it's actually the one around her neck around her waist that fell slack so right. that's how she's able to to stay safe and to you know pull this trick off right so she ends up like letting herself free and the gates are now open because it's daytime and the demons are no longer keeping anyone inside and some workers are coming through uh as as the movie ends and they're like huh seems like one hell of a party and you're like i get it that's because demons exactly yeah yeah um i think they say that they're the guys there to take the speaker system down because it was for the rented party because she had the dj playing for the for the party the night before so you know them not aware they're just there to you know do their job pick up the remains and move on yeah, yeah, it, it totally makes sense why they would be there, but I do think it's funny that they're just like, "Yep, we're uh, we're we're good." Uh, also, uh, anything weird happened last night? I smell a lot of sulfur and gunpowder, and uh, and also semen. Uh, and just... uh, yeah, you're definitely uh, a little bit more bloodier, and your clothes are a lot more tatted than they should be. You sure you're okay? You're yeah, right. you have no idea. <laughs> And then the movie ends. Right. Um, and so let's get into some performances. Like uh, Now that we've covered the plot, we'll get to how we felt about all of this in a minute. But any, you said that you really uh, enjoyed, at least aesthetically, the Shannon Elizabeth and, uh, and Dior Baird. Uh, or Bobby Sue yeah. Luther, sorry, uh, doing yeah. their dance. But it, like anybody else that you really want to point out, good or bad, in terms of the performances? 
I'll say this. The one that I actually kind of like is the one that plays Dex, the guy that, not Dex, Jason, the one that stays with him the longest. He just seems like that lovable kind of schlub that's, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. He's just there for the ride and tries to, you know, make the best of it as best he can. Uh, I, I kind of like him, you know, he, he's not the comedic relief that you would have expected him to be based on his look because he kind of has that uh, you know he's he's kind of like that you know shaggy haired kind of guy that you would expect to be just like cracking jokes at every situation but he's really not he takes it more seriously but he's just there as the you know the schlubby guy that's trying to you know just get out of this alive with his friends so yeah, uh, props for not making him a comedic relief and trying to, you know, force feed a bunch of lame jokes on our face, I guess. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I would also... Uh, Alright, I think... I think that most of the performances are kind of fine. I think Eddie Furlong just looks like trash in this movie. Like, he just looks yeah. like he got rousted from his trailer by like somebody opening up a fire extinguisher to wake him up or something he just looks like he is on one of the biggest benders in cinematic history like he should be hanging out with richard harris and peter o'toole it yeah 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 um it's not uh, like i said the 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 main cast what we get of them are competent you're not gonna you know look at these and say wow they deserved an oscar for that how did they the academy overlook them they're serviceable for this kind of a film you know it's a trashy horny b movie yeah they're they're serviceable enough for this kind of material most of them have actually performed in this in the past and they know what to do and they know how to you know emote and execute to what what's required for this scene so i don't have too many issues but yeah, uh, for Eddie Furlong just sticks out in this is not necess. I don't know why he's in this. Uh, his character doesn't even really seem to really need to be there, uh, especially as sort of like why he's the one cast in this kind of a role. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the the personal history of Eddie Furlong to any any degree other than he seems to have had a pretty rapid decline in Hollywood from like Terminator two to some starring roles in some horror movies, but kind of bigger horror movies. And then next thing you know, he's doing a lot of, a lot of B movies and, and not even necessarily the central character in them. Um, and it's really like that happens uh, more often than not, you know, is somebody gets that brush with greatness and then falls, but it is kind of, weird to see him in this role and see yeah. him look so out of shape and like it it he kind of embodies that idea of an actor that just kind of gave up at some point and he's not particularly good in this there are a couple of scenes where you can sort of tell that he's just really phoning it in um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, he, he's not. He's you know, he's he's probably the worst just by comparison. It's not yeah. an awful performance. He's definitely delivered worse. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, he's he's delivered worse. I mean, I'm just saying he's he definitely sticks out just compared to the rest because, like I said, the rest of the cast they're seasoned B movie veterans. They know what they're doing. Most of them have done these kinds of similar roles or you know in their career and they know they know their marks they know what they're doing and it, it shows it's not you know it's not high caliber performance it's serviceable that's like the best term to describe this it's all serviceable but because everything is serviceable he stands out because he's not serviceable throughout the entire film there's you know there's like you said there's issues where he kind of cracks there's issues where he just stand, you know. He looks like he's sputtering over his lines, and it it just stands out compared to the rest of the cast because they're a lot more even keeled than he is in his scenes. Yeah, or just trying. And it just yeah. seems, yeah, they they stand out. Like you said, they're trying. They're they know what they're doing, and then he just comes in, and it just feels like he's. It's a weird role for it to be him, like because he's in this as much as he is. Like you know, they're there's got to be some 
reason why he's involved as much as he is, because he stands out by virtue of the fact that he's the lowest on the totem pole. Yeah, it's it's very strange. Um, but yeah, I I think Monica Kina as Maddie is is totally fine. Um, I, like all the the ladies of Night of the Demons, I think acquit themselves pretty well. And like you said, and nobody in this movie. Uh, on on that side of things is a stranger to a B horror film, and and they know what what they're doing, and I think all that stuff works totally fine. Um, and I think you're right. I think the guy uh, who plays Dex. Let me let, let's get a name for Dex so we don't uh, we, we give him the proper. Uh, yeah, might uh, as well. Uh, now's the time to probably look up the IMDb. Yeah, uh, <laughs> okay. Michael C- uh, Copan. C O P O N? No, the other guy. I, I know oh. I know who he is. Um the other male. Because that's J- Dex. That's the guy that's yeah. Lily. And that's Jason. John F. Beach is the guy's name. Okay, yeah, um, that was the guy that I liked. Yeah. Yeah, and he's been in uh kind of a bunch of stuff. So um yeah. Seems like he's he's been around for a, a while. And I think he's he's pretty good in this. Um so yeah, I, I think performance wise it is it's a mixed bag but it's mostly competent um yeah um i I probably lean more on the positive side of um like you said competence that's a perfectly fine way of describing everything here and i so when i'm doing my notes on this stuff one of the things that i keep going back to is what is this movie about? What is the director trying to say with this movie? In some cases, that is a, a more obvious uh, sort of search than others. And this is one of those movies that I don't know that anybody was really trying to make any statement with it. The closest I could come was, I don't know, maybe putting the past behind you with Maddie, who used to date Colin, is now sort of free of those attachments but yeah um I, there's a lot of talk in the very beginning about not wanting their boyfriends around or trying to make you know trying to like move past their you know the recent relationship go out have fun like discover for yourself yeah there's a lot of those kind of like you know pep talks about you know don't let your past boyfriend get you down like move on to somebody else you know you could also say you know that kind of applies to you know d- leave the past alone where you know digging up the bones of the past by you know physically opening the door and and discovering the room that had these bodies laying around you know leave them alone leave the you know stop digging up the past I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that would be you know the intent behind it it could you know it could just be like a weird coincidence that that's just the way it is but uh, I wouldn't look past anybody that said that could be, you know, a potential theme in this one. Yeah, it's just tough to, if not that, then what? You know, <laughs> like <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the it's the one that's out there, and it's you know, it may not be the right one, but it's just like that's the most out of what's available. That's the most obvious one, I would say. Yeah. Um. All right. So, like I said, uh, the the. The theme discussion might be a little short, but let's get into sort of final thoughts. So uh, we've kind of danced around a little bit, but like what what have we not discussed that you want to make sure that we fit into this conversation? Uh, I mean, I, I gave a lot of uh, my thoughts at the, on this at the very beginning. Uh, like I said, this was the first one in the franchise I saw. So uh, it's the one that I, even though I don't, I really don't have like any kind of you know nostalgia or emotional attachment to it overall as soon as you said this is the one you were doing it's like okay yeah this is the one that you, i could probably have uh, some fun with and like i was mentioning earlier uh it i feel it was unfairly overlooked or overshadowed or you know just slipped through the cracks just because you know the time it came out the you know gluttony of remakes that it was involved in just sort of like around the general time of its release so it's a fun watch you're not gonna hate yourself uh you know like he said the performances are decent uh the gore in this is a lot better than you would uh, expect in this kind of a b movie um a lot of 
it's practical, which is um, always favorable. Uh, some decent CGI enhancements, although uh, the demon ash floating down to the basement uh, does not age well, um, especially on some uh, more modern systems that uh, kind of looks a little cheesy and corny, but... <laughs> yeah. Overall, uh, yeah, overall, um, high marks on the, uh, per- you know, solid performances across the board for the most part. Uh, above average um, practical effects work. Some underwhelming CGI, but not too bad. Uh, I, I mentioned, you know, there's a few storyline issues that are a little odd, but uh, yeah, this is definitely one that, you know, give it a chance, give it an open mind. You know, it's not the original. Don't get that mistaken in your head. Uh, it, you know, the original is, you know, a, a, it's a far superior film, but this is definitely one that I don't think you're going to be too mad at if you went in with an open mind. So uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to say uh, three and a half is my rating. Ah, fierce. All right. Um, yeah, I, I don't go quite that far with it. I think that there, this has a lot of the right pieces. Um, I do like the backstory. I do like uh, the setting. Um, it, you know, the whole house stuff from the original trilogy of movies, I think works well enough. But I do like this being kind of an old New Orleans haunted mansion. That That's really fun. Um, it, it is really horny. I always appreciate a good horny movie. Uh, but I, I do think that, especially that Eddie Furlong performance is really a drag and I just don't think it totally comes together. You know, it's like a recipe where all the ingredients are there, but the proportions are somehow wrong or something and it just doesn't taste quite right. Um, so, but you're right. It it's it's not a movie like if you're looking for a solid B movie that has a lot of effects and and mostly good effects and you know some pretty people being uh, possessed and and chasing each other around and whatnot. It's totally good for that. And so I kind of come in at a real like right down the middle two and a half stars on this one. Um, but that's also because I did grow up with Night of the Demons. I saw that a bunch and I have a lot of fondness for that at, at the time that I saw it in particular. Um, and if you listen to the conversation that I had with, uh, with Mark Ball about it, like both of us were just like, man, this, the lighting and the camera work in this movie is way better than you would expect it to be. Uh, and and this one is there's nothing wrong with the lighting or the camera work and there are times when it's pretty good but it's just not as flashy as as some of the stuff that uh happens in that OG Night of the Demons for me. Yeah, um I I'll give it this um since you brought it up. It does have that late 90s shot on digital video kind of a look. Yeah. It looks like it looks like a probably like a high-end direct-to-video film. And, yeah, and so that yeah. that is the perfect lead-in, thank you, Don, <laughs> to the three things that you may not know about the Night of the Demons remake from 2009. Uh, the first is, this was actually supposed to get a theatrical release, and then just due to some delays and so forth, it ended up being direct-to-DVD, um, which... Yeah. Which makes some sense. Like I could makes see, sense. I, I could totally yeah. see this being in the theater, but this also feels totally at home in that late two thousands direct to video era. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The the camera work I think is a big thing with that. Um, a lot of the shots just it feels like those those kinds of direct to video fare, not the you know the high end stuff that we got for the theatrical the the, the theater films at the time. This is definitely more in line with the direct-to-video stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, number two on the three things that you may not know about uh, this movie, it was actually all shot in New Orleans, uh, which I, I, I appreciate that. I like a good location shoot, and I like the fact that we do actually see... It's not all set on a stage somewhere. 
that you get some actual shots of New Orleans and that kind of thing. And that goes a long way with me, and I appreciate any movie that does it. Um, so and the, the third and final thing that you may not know about this movie, and this is a little more personal because this is a guy that I've actually uh, talked to, but uh, the director of Waxwork, Anthony Hickox, was set to direct a sequel to this movie that would have been called Night of the Demons After Party. But unfortunately, uh, the way they were going to raise the money for it was a Kickstarter, which did not succeed. And uh, th the interesting thing, though, about that is that th the story of it was supposed to be the character of Diana, the, the woman at the door, played by Tiffany Shepis, that she throws her own party and ends up being possessed by Angela. And I... You know, as far as ideas for sequels to Night of the Demons goes, not the worst. Yeah, I could buy that, yeah. Um, I, it's been ages since I've seen Part 2, and um, unfortunately at the time of recording, it's not out yet. So I don't remember how they got how they got two together. What was the setup for that one in the original series? Oh, it, the, the setup for Night of the Demons 2 is that the sister, the younger sister of Angela um, is going to a uh, Catholic school right down the road from a whole house. And I think it's set like six or eight years later. I can't remember which one of the two. And mm -hmm. um, there's a dude named Perry who is interested in demonology and uh, a sexy little minx gets her hand on that book and decides that she wants to screw with Angela's sister, so takes everybody out to Hull House um, to screw with the younger sister of Angela, and sh one thing leads to another, and, you know, possession and whatnot. But I like that movie because it goes from the Catholic school to Hull House, then back to the school, and then back to Hull House and during the course of the movie. Mm. Yeah, I, I I've seen it a cup. I've seen it maybe once or twice, and like I said, it's been years. And uh, unfortunately, at the time of recording, I you know I haven't heard episode two yet, so I I couldn't remember. So yeah, um, I like that one as a sequel idea a lot more than what After Party would have been. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, the the premise from what you, from what I've read of it because I did remember hearing that the it was one of those infamous kickstarter fails that was just massively underfunded in the amount of time that they had mm -hmm. so yeah uh not the worst idea but um i, I would have watched it a hundred percent like i'm a sucker for i i like a good b horror movie and i've seen this 2009 night of the demons you know now that i've done the show on it i've probably seen it three or four times so even though I'm, you know, I'm getting all high and mighty with my two and a half stars, but I've still seen this movie a bunch because I like a movie where you trap a bunch of young, pretty people in a house and then have demonic possession stuff happen. Uh, it, it seems to me that there ought to be more of these than there are, but, you know, I don't get to make them. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. So, uh, look, first of all, this has been a tremendous amount of fun. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Same here. Um, second of all, because I know people, uh, because of your dulcet tones and your, and your good nature, people are going to want to listen to more of you. <laughs> Where can they do such a thing? Uh, yeah. So um, my, you can uh, check out uh, my work on a show called Normal Room in Hell Presents Fresh Cuts. I'm uh, one of the co-hosts on that show. Uh, it's a uh, side cast under the main show, No More Room in Hell. And uh, on Fresh Cuts, it's a uh, weekly look at the uh, biggest genre release of the current week. So the late theatrical streaming, um, you know, direct-to-video, what have you. Uh, you know, basically, we just take a look and uh, rate and review the movie. So uh, that's weekly on uh, the Dark Discussions Network. Uh, you also alluded to um, us joining soon together on a, a sec second show called No More Room in Hell Presents Creature Comforts, which uh, you're going to be joining us in a couple of weeks to look at uh, one of my favorite films, uh, Them. So 
mild spoilers for that discussion, but uh, seriously, calling them one of my favorite films is not really a discussion. <laughs> if you've seen the film, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, that's when, not necessarily. When that's I was not a spoiler. When I was talking to Venom about it, because he, he asked me like, "Do you have a movie in mind?" And I was like, "We got to do them because it's just one of the best creature features ever made." And yeah, I I love them. Yeah. So like the preview of that discussion is right here with both of us. Exactly. <laughs> just if telling. You've seen the film, if you've seen the film, calling that a great, you know, a lot of fun is not a, not necessarily a, a spoiler. But uh, yeah, that's going to be a fun little preview for that. And I'm really looking forward to it. The sheer amount of flamethrowers in that movie. Oh, God. <laughs> makes it one of the greatest <laughs> films of all time. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, may not necessarily bring up a lot of uh, fond memories for you, but uh, I think it kind of rivals the uh, scene from The Swarm. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know that's not necessarily a fun time because I remember reading or remember hearing the uh, Pick 6 episode. The, the Yeah, the which, biggest... Uh, the problem with The Swarm is it's just boring. And, yeah. And them the is two and not. A half hour, two and a half hour disaster movie creature feature is not the most enthralling kind of a film out there. Yeah. Uh, I... I you guys definitely made it um, a lot more fun than the actual movie itself, so kudos to that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Savage Beast with John Saxon, far superior Killer Bee movie. Or even uh, the Mexican film, um, uh, Asesinos of Bejos, if you've seen that one. I don't know if I have seen that one. Oh, that one's a lot of fun, too. Um, I think it may be on YouTube. Uh, I saw it floating around on there not too long ago. All right, so, um, I'll I'll, I'll yeah. dig into it. Like you, I I think you and I are both like this. Where if you if you tell me that there is some kind of bug or creature that is, is like besieging a small town, then I'm a hundred percent in. I'll like I will watch any alligator, crocodile, tiger, yeah. bear, <laughs> bugs, whatever it is. If they're attacking people, I want to see it. Yeah, um, you're not wrong. Um, I would list. Uh, I would definitely, f- for sure, say creature features are a big favorite of mine, which is why we're on the show. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, what else? Yeah, though I keep um, interrupting and, you. What else? Yeah, Sorry. no, uh, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Uh, the last one of mention is a uh, show called Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. Uh, we are we took a hiatus for the uh, summer to deal with a uh, couple of issues, but. Uh, we are back. We have a uh, recording that is going to be released uh, relatively soon. Uh, we looked at uh, Gamera versus Barugon, and uh, we did a uh, we continued our retrospective on Ultraman, which is the uh, format of the show. For those not listening, for those that don't know, it's a uh, episode. It's a show where we look at a giant monster movie. We alternate between Godzilla and non Godzilla per episode. And then we review one episode of Ultraman. So that was uh, the last episode. It should be available by the time you hear this. So, uh, yeah, that will be in there. I'm saving the best for last because uh, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space is available on the Kill the Cast feed. We don't have an individual feed for ourselves. It's on uh, Kill the Cast, which is part of the lovely Legion network that um, you're currently listening to me on. The uh, other two are part of the Dark Discussion Network, and you can find them both on them or through the No More Room in Hell feed. So, yeah, um, other than that, uh, you can find my uh, written work online because I do uh, movie reviews and write ups um, on my website at donshorrorworld.blogspot.com. Uh, absolutely. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I'm working my way slowly through all the host lists of No More Room in Hell. I'm eventually going to complete the full set. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, you know, as you probably uh, know and or heard, uh, Venom was with me on the first two Psycho episodes, and that was a delight as well. I, I just love all you guys. You guys are the best. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, if you are listening to this, ladies and jelly spoons. Be sure that you are checking out No More Room in Hell and all the offshoot shows as well, uh, because you will be hearing uh, more of those voices on this show. So, um, all right, Don, thank you again. Uh, I'm going to let you go now, and I'll be right back to close out the show. 
All right. Well, uh, like I said, this was so much fun. Uh, I had a blast, and uh, thank you for having me. For sure. And there you have it. That is my conversation with Don and Ellie. Uh, again, thank you to Don for being part of the show. Uh, I really enjoyed that conversation a whole lot. I hope you did too. And uh, a little bit of maintenance here. Um, as you are listening to this, I am actually out of town. Uh, but I will be back shortly uh, in December to uh, start a new series. Um, just to let you know what is ahead on the Dark Parade. In addition to more bonus episodes, there will be a new Heart of Horror in December. Uh, we will be doing another What You Watching in December. And uh, some other stuff, I think I'm going to I'm gonna try to uh, fit in some more fun stuff, uh, some bonus stuff there as well. But uh, you can also look for two main episodes covering Let the Right One In and Let Me In. Uh, the classic vampire film and the remake of, of said uh, vampire film. And we're also going to be doing all the Ding Dong uh, Black Christmas movies. Black Christmas, Black Xmas, Black Christmas again. We're going to do all of those. So uh, I look forward to covering those movies. And spoilers, I've never seen any of them. I never even saw the original Black Christmas. It's just one of those movies I missed. So that's going to be a first time watch for me. Yeah, I'm very excited to do that series. Uh, that is mostly lined up at this point. And so that's what you can expect for December and moving into the new year. Uh, after that, in, come January, I'm not really sure. So if you have some ideas, uh, let me know what you might like to see. And I'm kind of cooking up some ideas myself, and uh, we'll see how all that fits. Uh, thank you, as always, for listening. Be sure to drop by. If you're on Facebook or Meta or whatever the hell they're calling it now, uh, there is the Dark Parade Facebook group. Uh, I tend to be very active in that. Um, also, on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod, you can at me there. And you will certainly get a response very quickly. And that's kind of it. I think I've got an Instagram, but I just, I don't know. I don't really use it. I'm not a picture guy as a rule. Old man Bo, not, not understanding the Instagram or, or the ticky tocky. <laughs> Sorry, that's, <laughs> that's my grandpa voice. But thanks for listening. And uh, as ever, thank you for being a part of this. And we'll see you soon on the Dark Parade. <laughs>